And um, hello, everyone. This is the Circuit Pipeline Weekly for September 19th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on certain Circuit Python. What is Circuit Python? Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Circuit Python development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit. So if you want to support them and Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join the server anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time at 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when it coincides in the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so this gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's doc notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages. That's that little pin icon, at the push pin icon at the top to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes to the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. The second is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. The third is hug reports. The fourth is status updates. And the fifth is in the weeds. I'll explain these things as we go along. Since almost everybody is already familiar. Um, so with that, I'll begin by uh, reading community news. Um, uh, let me get a timestamp here. Um, the news here is collected in the Circuit Python in the weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out on Tuesday mornings. You can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python and hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please con consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR in GitHub, uh, tag at sign N underscore engineer on Twitter with the hashtag CircuitPython or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. Any of those are fine. We get news anyway. And it doesn't have to be about CircuitPython. It can be about things related to Python or MicroPython or anything else that seems kind of vaguely relevant. Okay, so I'll re begin reading the community news. Uh, first item we've got here, Arduino IDE 2.0 was finally released. It's been in beta for a long time. Uh, after a lengthy test period, testing period, Arduino announced that the Arduino IDE 2.0 has moved to stable and is available for download. It has a modern editor and provides a better overall user experience thanks to a responsive interface and faster compilation time. It's really, it's quite a bit nicer looking. Try it, try it out. You can, and you can have more than one version of the IDE installed if you feel like it. So I'd recommend that you try it. Uh, next item, uh, diode which is a uh, virtual hardware um, IDE kind of, makes it easy to build, program, and run hardware projects in the browser, save time and money waiting on parts, shorten feedback loops, and build hardware better. The syntax is Python. You can play with a very limited demo now. Go to withdiode.com to see more information. You can sign up for more information. Um, Next, let's talk about the Circuit Python Show. The Circuit Python Show is an independent podcast hosted by Carl Cutler, focusing on the people doing awesome things with Circuit Python. Each episode features Paul in conversation with the guest for a short interview. The latest episode was released September 19th with guest Thea Flowers. 
Thea shares how she discovered CircuitPython, her synthesizer company Winterbloom, and how her products use CircuitPython. And if you want, follow Thea on Twitter. She's got a lot of interesting to say, things to say about hardware design. It's fun. Um, next item, Baker, maker Becky Stern has a new electronic video series for DigiKey. So um, Becky Stern used to work for Adafruit, uh, did an awful lot of work on wearables that had electronics in them, um, made some really nice projects. So she now has a new video series that she's doing for, for DigiKey. Becky has always done an outstanding job of explaining what can be intimidating technically in an entertaining and digestible way. And there's some links in the notes about how to find out more about this newsletter. I mean, this uh, series and uh, some blog posts about it and the like. So thank you. It sounds great. Take a look at it. Next up, uh, the CircuitPython Community Help Desk returns September 29th. We already had uh, one uh, kind of the initial try of the CircuitPython Community Help Desk, which seems to work very, out very well. Uh, that one was on Saturday morning. This one is going to be uh, a week from Thursday, um, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That's U.S. time. Uh, developers will be on hand to get you ready for Hacktoberfest and share how to participate in Hacktoberfest by contributing to CircuitPython and its libraries. So we'll have more next week. So take, take a look. Um, newsletter, next up is newsletter details. I already mentioned, please send, a lot of this news comes from, or all of it comes from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter. It's really the Python or microcontrollers weekly newsletter. Um, Contribute to it, please. We will love to have stuff in it. Uh, the more images and other stuff, the better. All right. Next up is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka, which is a statistical overview of the entire project. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're up to. Uh, we'll talk about the overall project and then separately discuss the core firmware libraries and the Blinka project. Okay, overall in the past week, there were 42 pull requests merged by 22 authors. Some ones I haven't seen before are Ducky the Scientist, Wind Stormger, um, Strider21, ALS Programmer, SNYKMKRCT, um, TWA127, and which is great, oh, Flom84, I don't think I've seen that either. But if we've worked before, that's fine. Great. Thank you for contributing. Of these 42 pull requests, uh, there, were nine, nine, there were nine reviewers, and there were 43 issues closed by nine people and 16 open by nine people. All right. Um, next up is a report about the core. Uh, Jeff has volunteered to talk about it. Thank you, Jeff. Hello. Yes, I have. I just have to find the right part of the document. So the core is the part of the uh, CircuitPython that is written in the C language and that kind of makes everything work. And um, in the past week, we had 18 pull requests merged from 13 authors. And some of those that Dan listed off before were contributing to the core. So what a way to start. Uh, when Stormger and Flom84 and Strider21 were some of those names. So thank you very much. Oh, and uh, Lee, uh, L. Atkinso42, um, I think that's your first pull request. So that's exciting. Um, and in terms of reviewers, we had the normal crew of uh, people. So thanks to Gambler and Naradoc and Microdev outside of Adafruit for uh, putting in those reviews. It really helps us. And Katni will tell you more about reviews and being a reviewer uh, in her section in a little bit. In terms of pull requests, we've got 17 open pull requests, and about the first half dozen of those are over 120 days old. Um, if those are in a draft state or if they are looking for changes, please uh, do that when you get a chance. And if you're waiting on something from us, please feel free to ping again. We do occasionally drop the ball, and uh, your general reminder will help get things back on the road again. Then we've also got uh, about five PRs that are under 10 days, so. Um, it would be good to just keep an eye on everything on that list, as you all know. Issues-wise, we had eight closed issues by three people and six new issues opened by six people. So 
the number trends down this week. It'll trend a different way another week. Uh, but we appreciate everyone who worked on those issues and everybody who's reporting uh, new issues. Um, you know, when you're having a problem, there's probably other people having the same problem. So we need to know about it. That leaves us 574 open issues. Um, we mostly organize how we work on issues in the core by milestones. So for version eight, we have 43 open issues that we'd like to resolve um, before we issue a final 800 release. And we may add or remove items from that list according to our feelings at any time. And for version 7.3, we have zero open issues. So that's nothing pending that would make us make another 7.3 release right now. And when these statistics were generated, we had five issues not assigned a milestone. Although while we were doing the uh, earlier bits of the meeting, I did go through and assign milestones to all of those. So that's now zero issues not assigned a milestone and probably about 45 issues assigned to the 800 milestone. So uh, that's how that cookie crumbled. Um, you know, I have not actually been doing a lot of work directly on the core right now. I know Dan is very focused on um, moving towards the 800 release, and that's great. Uh, I'm take, being taken in, a, in uh, another direction right now, and so I think is microdev. But, uh, you know, anything that you can do to help us work through those open issues and release version 8 or do testing of the version 8 beta, it would be really helpful. So, um, you know, according to what you're able to do, we'd appreciate your help with that. And we are, as ever, inching towards version 8. And that's what I've got for the core. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. I'll just uh, note that there are some, I think there are some issues in the 800 um, milestone that are marked as needs retesting. They're tagged with that tag. So if you have the time to take a chance to find those and just test them again and see if the problems still exist, that would be uh, very helpful. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is the state of the libraries and Katni, I believe we'll talk about it. Thanks, Dan. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras such as our the community bundle and our cookie cutter. Over all of these repos, we had 20 pull requests merged from eight different authors and four different reviewers. Uh, two of those pull requests were over 12 days old, so we're still keeping up with um, older PRs, and uh, most of them were um, zero to four days old, uh, so it's good we're keeping up with newer ones as well. And that leaves us with 33 open pull requests. In terms of issues, we had 34 closed issues by five people and 10 open by three people, so we are down quite a bit um, to 599 open issues, which is great. We're under 600 again. Um, and 138 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, you have a couple options. If you'd like to get into reviewing, you can t go to, or either way, you can go to circuitpython.org slash contributing. Um, if you're interested in reviewing, check out the open PR list. Uh, it'll give you an opportunity to pick something that interests you. If um, you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, take a look at the code, see how it looks to you. Leave a comment and let us know. After you get comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the open issue list. They are set, uh, set up to be by um, repository, and the issue name is on that page, so you can search for different things. Um, if you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Um, we also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. So don't let the process intimidate you. We can definitely help you be able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, and there is a list of updated libraries in the notes if you are interested. Um, and that's what I've got. Okay. Thank you, Katni. Um, next up is Blinka. Um, Maker Melissa is not available today, so I'll read this section. Just as a way of introduction, Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython on single board computers like Raspberry Pi. So you can run CircuitPython libraries under regular Python, which is also known as CPython, somewhat confusingly, because the C is not for circuit. Um, and um, 
Blinka is the glue that lets you do that. It's the shim that lets you use CircuitPython style code in regular Python. Okay, so in the past week, there were four, four uh, pull requests merged by two authors, and there was one reviewer. There are still six open pull requests. There was one issue closed by one person and zero open by zero people. So that's no new issues. Very nice. There are still 83 open issues on the Blinker repository. There were 12,427 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and not, we're supporting 91 boards right now, which is terrific. Okay. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start as the host, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, but have hug reports in the notes document, I'll read them off as I get to you in the list. Okay, so as I said, I'll start. Uh, thanks to Microdev for working on updating our use of the ESP IDF from uh, ESP IDF for version 4.4 to uh, 5.0. Um, this is a pre some preliminary work, which we're probably not going to put in CircuitPython 8, but it's really helpful that Microdev is working on this. There's a lot of busy work involved. There are a API changes and other changes between version 4.4 and version 5. Thanks to Lee, also known as uh, LAKITSO42 on GitHub, for adding bulk analog input, input to CircuitPython and persevering through extensive uh, naming churn. There was a lot of uh, discussion in the in the pull request about how things should be named, and then build issues and other things. And I re really appreciate Lee working on this. It's something that we've wanted for a long time, and it's now merged in. And thanks to Johnny Bergdahl, who noticed some translation issues. He's always on top of doing, updating the Swedish translation as soon as he hears that there's something to, to do, and he pointed out an issue, and we fixed it right away. We really appreciate that. Okay, next up is uh, C. Grover. I'll read their contribution. To Narodoc and Tectric for assistance with some recent community bundle PRs. They were very patient and helpful. Next is Charles uh, B. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, it. A group hug for all. And next up is David Cloud. Um, I'll read this also. Thanks to Paul Cutler for hosting the meeting last week. I was super confused because I did hear the CircuitPython show music. Some voices are just music to me. Maybe there was a big difference of audio level between Paul's microphone and everyone else's. Okay, next up is um, DJ Devin. Go ahead. I'd like to send a hug to Foamy Guy for all of his streams this week. I learned a couple of new tricks with PyCharm uh, that were really cool, especially didn't know you could use Git with PyCharm, so that was nice. Uh, a hug to Paint Your Dragon for the penguin silkscreen thingy, and that looks like it'll save all the Eagle designers out there a lot of time for um, creating their, or transitioning their silkscreen stuff. <laughs> uh, text to silkscreen, I should say. And a hug to Phil T for personally handing a newsletter support question. He went above and beyond for uh, for fixing that issue. Uh, ended up being user error, my fault. A hug to Dan H for hosting the meeting and for all the voodoo magic he does on the back end every single day. And a hug to everyone who's working on projects for CircuitPython or Adafruit. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's move on to Foamy Guy. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, this week, hug reports uh, for C. Grover for sharing a palette fader library uh, in the community bundle that works with Display.io. Uh, also, separately, another one for looking into some technical approaches to find color similarity uh, between multiple colors. Uh, hug report to Tectric uh, for all of his work on uh, library reviews and PR tests and things like this. Uh, across the several months that Tectric has been involved, he's done so many things. Uh, so thank you to Tectric. Um, thank you to Katni uh, for some help and advice about communicating with a contributor. Um, and then lastly, a group hub. Thanks to everyone. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up is Jeff. Hello again. I wanted to thank Anne for sharing a cool new poster with me uh, earlier in an, our internal meeting, and to Katni for sharing something else cool with me this weekend. 
Uh, Dan, thank you for staying on top of the CircuitPython core, uh, nearly single-handedly while I'm focused on PyCal. To Tectric and Naradoc for discussions of libraries and typing information just this morning. And uh, Jimmo at MicroPython uh, has continued plugging away at a core flash memory size savings idea and is putting in an enormous amount of work. And you know, I look forward to being able to take advantage of that work when we do the next MicroPython merge. So thanks for that. That's what I got. All right. Thank you, Jeff. OK, next up is Katni. Uh, first up, I have a hug for Paul Cutler for hosting his first Circuit Python Weekly last week. Um, to Tammy Makes Things for a lovely chat and helping with a couple things this weekend. To Anne B for helping as well. To Jeff for a quick chat and a much needed opinion. To Tectric for Adabot fixes, uh, regardless of who caused them. And a group hug. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, uh, next up, I'll read more gamblers. Um, thanks to Lee for all the work with the bulk analog IOPR that was now merged. Yes, plus one. Uh, next up is Paul Cutler. Uh, I'll read his contribution. Hug to Katney for all her help last week with hosting the weekly meeting. Hug to the Ruiz brothers and John Park for the walk MPERS MP3 serves and I, we have to decide how to pronounce this, like walk person project. I'm printing the parts now and looking forward to building something similar. Thanks to Tectric for helping with feedback on my first CircuitPython PR to fix a small issue in the MacroPad doc strings. Next up is MicroDev. I'll read theirs. Uh, group hug. Thanks to Dan H for quickly creating forks of some expressive repos which need customization to work in CircuitPython. And thanks to Jepler for pointing out possible kin pin conflict situations in the coprocessor PR number 6902. Next up, Tammy makes things. I'll read theirs. Hug to Katni for a great chat yesterday and a group hug. Next is Tectric, also text only. I'll read it. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy for co-reviewing a PR with me. I always appreciate having another set of eyes and ideas on things. Thanks to Paul Cutler for their first CircuitPython PR. Thanks to Paul Cutler again for getting information to Anne about the upcoming community help desk. Thanks to C. Grover for all the awesome community bundle contributions. Thanks to Katni for helping me finally fix the, the Adabot issue in generating the library infrastructure issues page. Thanks to Jepler for the great idea of making actions for our library CI. Thanks to Jepler again for the great suggestion on adding MyPy to pre-commit. Very excited to look more into it. That will be very interesting, and may find we may find a number of bugs by that, by doing type checking uh, during uh, library builds, and finally a group hug. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll move on to status updates. Um, that's our. This is our time to sync up on what we're doing. I'll start, and we'll go through the list alphabetically as before. When I call on you, just take a chance to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what we're doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too much for status updates, we can move it to the in the weeds section, which is at the end. All right, I'll start. Um, in the last week, um, I've been working on this for a while. Uh, it's gone through multiple iterations, but uh, I've added the ability to preserve the state of pin state, that is digital in out state, during deep sleep. So when you enter deep sleep, you can give it a list of digital in out pins. And instead of everything being reset to some uniform high or low state or uh, floating state, you could say, please leave this pin high and make it and have it be an output. Please leave this pin as an input and uh, have a pull down, that kind of thing. This is currently implemented on Espressif only. Um, if somebody wants to look at it for other ports, that would be great. Uh, our, our first use for it is on Espressive, just as we did deep sleep for Espressive first. Espressive also has an unusual way of doing uh, pin holding. So it's kind of uh, specific to that port. Um, then I've been trying to prune the bug list down, as we mentioned. So there were several, three or, two or three or four issues that I worked on and either closed or had further questions or fixed them. And in non-CircuitPython news, 
we've been doing a lot of rearranging of furniture in the house uh, to move a home office from a, to another room, not my office, um, but someone else's. And it involved uh, like musical chairs with six pieces of heavy furniture. Uh, a lot of trouble, but it looks better. And I installed some more carpet tiles because I moved some furniture off the floor where the carpet tiles needed to go. And this time I didn't slice my thumb open when I was doing that, which was good. I'm wearing a pot holder on my hand now while I'm using the carpet knife. And then going along with this, there's a lot of musical chairs involving the insides of computers. So there are older computers that are being replaced with newer computers and the disk drives are swapping between them. And that caused me no end of grief last night until two in the morning. And uh, I think it's all straightened out now. But doing dual boot, setting up dual boots uh, in the proper order and making sure that they work properly is a total pain. All right. I'll move on to see Grover's text, text only. Inspired by Foamy Guy's flip clock project, started working on a method to update a display I.O. palette for setting chroma key, that is green screen transparency. The quest required an unplanned detour into RGB color value comparison land. It's a glowy place made vibrant with its three suns. I have a working algorithm and test that needs a couple of tweaks. The next challenge is to provide a logical and user-friendly tolerance setting for reducing anti-aliasing edge effects. And there's a little picture here in the, um, a better picture in the chat, actually. Thank you, C. Grover. Okay. Next up, I'll read David Cloud's contribution. Please scroll in the Discord chat and vote for a name for a feature name in CircuitPython.org board selection. Uh, go to CircuitPython-org issues 1032. Take a look at that. David recovered and tested my Pi USB code for the Buzz, quote, joystick, unquote. Tested some Arduino USB host examples for keyboard pass-through for the Teensy. I was misled to believe that USB host was supported in CircuitPython and TT 4.1 by Twitter user River Wang and also by release notes of 7.3, so I tried. Then I watched one of the two deep dives on the subtopic by Scott. Then I found issue 6527 that explains the status. Then I watched two or three videos from AT Makers Bill Binko. Now I want to replicate one of his USB filter PCBs, which are two trinkies, trinkets back to back, or a trinket talking to an RT, uh, talking to RP2040 cutie pie. If somebody is interested in working on USB host, we'd love to have you work on it. Uh, it's something that we would like to have, but uh, we have, don't have enough uh, person power to do everything right now. Okay, thanks, D uh, David. Let's go on. Uh, DJ Devin, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, this week I received a bunch of Adafruit's new uh, three-foot magnetic USB-C cables and tips for my boards. Uh, these things are awesome. Worth noting that you can use these as a practical replacement for an on-off switch for the Pi Pico. So you just unplug it and plug it back in. It magnetic. You don't have to worry about fumbling around with trying to figure out which way it's flipped over correctly, like USB or even sometimes USB micro is. Um, USB-C is kind of immune to that, though. Um, I highly rec recommend everyone add them to your arsenal. Adafruit just added the Micro B and iOS Lightning tips to the store this week. And I would love to see some six-foot versions for headphones so you don't rip out your headphone cords. So that would be nice. Uh, this week, I worked on, or I ignored, uh, the RFM LoRa Messenger project had to completely move that to the side as a 16-step sequencer has taken all of my attention. Um, there was a poorly designed pull-up circuit for the I2C expanders that I didn't catch in my first revision. Uh, so I had to run a whole bunch of bodge wire in order to get the Pico to communicate with the I2C expander chips. Got that working. Um, and then, yeah, and then Sunday, that was on Friday, and then on Sunday night, I thought some of the traces were touching that I missed during routing, and then all five boards were paperweights. And then just before the meeting, when I was working with some code, I figured out that the footprint I used for the MCP expander chips, and because uh, I use easy EDA, 
um, they were half of the pins were backwards on the on the footprint. So I just started running all the stuff and doing a blink sketch and started lighting up uh, the LEDs that way. Uh, I will be fixing all of these issues in a new batch of prototype boards, and thankfully, because I go with JLPCB, they're pretty cheap. So this is a valid kind of, you know, somewhat expensive, it's more expensive than perf board, but it's still kind of valid. Uh, yeah, they're and they are pretty. Um, let's see. Eventually, when I have working prototypes, I intend to give them away to whoever wants one. Developers and Pythonesas get first dibs. Um, and I have had a busy yet unsuccessful week here so far uh, dealing with uh, the PCB stuff. So that's all I got is some PCB updates. Okay, thank you very much, DJ Devin. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, last week I did some further PR reviews uh, and testings. Um, I worked on the typing annotations as well as doc strings and cleanups for, uh, and I should say, and cleanup of the flip clock widget uh, library. Uh, I also learned how to use uh, Typer, the Python module Typer, uh, which I think I owe a belated hub report. I believe maybe Detectric is the one who pointed me towards Typer, um, but I'm not 100% sure. I apologize if I got that wrong. Uh, but I learned about Typer and used it to make the sprite sheet generator that goes with the flip clock widget uh, into a command line interface tool that has arguments that let you pass in all the different options um, to customize your flip clock visual effects. Um, this week, I have been working on gathering some notes and helpful scripts that I have used at various points throughout the past year or so to uh, carry out some automated tasks across all the libraries. I think the first one I did was around this time last year for Hacktoberfest, making the type uh, annotation issues, and I've built up a small um, kind of cache of helpful uh, tips and tricks and scripts that make it easier to do that. So I've got all of those pulled into one place and actually presented uh, in a nice, easy to, plan, easy to find place and kind of went through all of my thoughts surrounding this and got them all into a readme file uh, for myself and others to be able to refer back to. A um, couple other things this week, I'll be generating some more sprites for the flip clock with uh, different fonts and maybe other different visual effects like gradients uh, or some fun things like that. And then I'm hoping to submit that uh, flip clock widget to a bundle uh, sometime later on this week. So uh, that's what I've got going on. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the guy. Hey, next up is Jeff. Hi, so uh, last week, a guide of mine went live on the Adafruit Learning System. It shows how to hook a Commodore 16 keyboard up to your modern computer with USB HID. It's a pretty simple uh, eight rows, eight columns keyboard, but I do show some cool techniques in the guide, such as how to await a keypad event. This works with any of the three kinds of classes in the keypad module, but needs a little core tweak uh, that is in the 8.0 beta versions for it to work. I have continued working on the Pico W, also known as the Pi Cow. The latest milestone is that I can ping another computer on the internet. And I learned that you can use emoji in GitHub branch names, but maybe you shouldn't. Just this morning, uh, or I guess, I, I think I started yesterday, playing with type checking our annotations with MyPy. I did a draft pull request in a uh, repo that was really close to passing uh, all of MyPy's type checks. Um, we need to agree on an approach, which um, Tectric and Naradoc were very helpful, as I mentioned earlier, talking about this. Uh, but I think we might end up with three different levels, none, non-strict, and strict, depending how complete the typing information is. And I'm not sure, but I think some of the libraries may be able to go to strict soon, but hopefully we can make all of them pass non-strict someday. Uh, and another thing that I did last week was I scanned and posted to archive.org a cool book from the 80s about floppy disks. It's half informative and half tongue in cheek. And I linked to the Adafruit blog post that I made uh, in the notes doc. I'll drop that in the channel in just a second. Anyway, this week, working on PyCow. The next visible milestone will be to resolve a host with socket pools, get adder info method. There are about three invisible milestones before I get to that. Uh, and I hope to publish a second keyboard guide on the Tandy 1000 before the end of the month of Septandy, but PyCow does take precedence. And I have a total of six different keyboards that I'd like to turn into guides over the next months, all different. And Dan, I just wanted to suggest in this moment, 
uh, whether you would want us to all meet some point this week to do triage of the 800 bugs and or those uh, long open pull requests. So if you want to do that, just, you know, we should chat about it. And that's what I'm doing. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I think we will. Maybe not today, but uh, sometime this week would be a good idea to do that. Um, and Katni is can join us as well. That would be a good idea. All right. I appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Katni. Thanks, Dan. So last week, I finally published the Wi-Fi mailbox notifier guide that I've been working on for an exorbitantly long time. Um, I got my bivalent COVID booster and flu shot Wednesday afternoon and spent Thursday and Friday resting off the side effects. Uh, so this week, um, there's one last addition to the uh, mailbox notifier guide, show an external antenna mounted to the mailbox in case more range is needed or if the mailbox is metal. Uh, I need to post board files for uh, part number 5613. It's a new breakout, um, the iSpy breakout board. Um, there's not going to be a guide for that yet, I think, um, but that needs uh, at least the, the board files posted. Um, I'm going to be doing the QT update, STEMI QT update to the quad alphanumeric backpack guide. And then following that, a guide for the LTR329 and LTR303 boards. Um, didn't make a note of it, but after that is going to be... Um, fixing up the Metro Mini guide to add the Metro Mini version 2, which has a STEMI QT connector on it. And uh, Hacktoberfest is coming up soon, so we are all starting to talk about that and um, do some preparation and so on and so forth. Um, so we will be participating this year and uh, as we did last year. Um, so if you're interested in helping out in uh, reviewing and you're on the review team, let us know. Um, I think we already kind of have folks in place so there's there's not like a desperate need um, or anything like that. But obviously if you are already one of our reviewers and you're interested in helping out, just let us know and we will make sure to involve you in the coordination. And um, that's what I have this week. Okay, I just, and I just, thank you, Kat, Dan. I just take a look at the, at the uh, guide fo co photo of a mailbox, which is terrific in the notes here i'll scroll up so you can see it there you go very nice thank you kat all right um now i have some people who are text only first paul cutler a uh, new episode of the circuit python show released today featuring thea flowers released the trailer for the bootloader a new podcast with my co-host todd bot first episode debuts next monday um, next is tammy make things Worked on a fix for the problem of Circup creating extended attribute files on device on the current Mac OS beta. I have a solution to the problem and I need to finish figuring out how to implement a unit test for it before I submit a PR. Looking to do some PR reviews this week and have carved out time for that. Another super busy week with the day job. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, but it might just be the headlights of an oncoming train. Uh oh, but uh, you'll make it through. Good luck. Next up is Tectric, also text only. Last week, went through all the library issues and tagged applicable ones as good first issue in preparation for Oktoberfest. I thought there were more good first issues than before. That's, thank you very much. Patched the aforementioned Adabot issue in generating the library infrastructure issues page on circuitpython.org, which helped in finding good issues for Oktoberfest. Submitted PR for Blinkit to update underscore underscore version underscore underscore variable upon release added more cross-link documentation for the core started link creating a repository for hosting the build and release ci's used by the libraries to use them as a github action as suggested by jepler uh, this will help avoid adabot pot patches and associated cleanup every time we do things like repin the version of black in personal projects, I ordered what I think is the last round of development PCBs for my Menorah board project. I also wrote all the code that runs on a Linode server that helps me test the functionality of the Menorah by acting as a fake time service API and now automatically deploys when I merge pull requests. All right. This week, 
fix the issue with Adabot not reporting the unknown milestone issues. Nice to think we have only five issues, but I'll look into fixing the bug. More preparation for Oktoberfest and the community help desk that will help prepare people for the events. Working on a GitHub action that can be used to create MPY zip files and releases similar to the way libraries do it now, which I think may be useful for personal projects. I'll add that to the CircuitPython GitHub org as well. Looking, look into Jepler's pre-commit MyPy suggestion. Look at other, looking at other additions to my CircuitPython iBeacon, li iBeacon library. Testing the library CI actions and maybe adding them to the cookie cutter so they can be tested on a new library as it's being developed. Okay, thank you for the extensive update, Tetrick. All right, the next section is in the weeds, uh, where we can uh, follow up maybe on some issues here or bring in some other more long form discussions that either come out of status updates or the folks have identified it ahead of time. Uh, if you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things. So we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. So first up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, mainly, I am interested in getting feedback uh, from the team if we are interested in trying out the MPY size uh, actions additions. Um, there's an open PR on the cookie cutter, uh, which has those, but there is a PR on the specific library EMC 2101, uh, which I think will make a good candidate to test it on individually. Uh, because we know that the size will go up a little bit um, and so we can see the output from it and we can get a chance to test it on a single one before we make a decision on cookie cutter and certainly before we uh, start trying to roll it out to the rest of the library so um, that's the main thing i'm interested in is if there's any feedback or objections to trying out the changes from that cookie cutter pr but specifically in the EMC 2101 uh, library, so we can see what it what it outputs for us. Okay, is there any, and is there any, uh, I think this is kind of all informational, but um, are you looking for any volunteers? Um, no, I can definitely oh. do it, just looking to make sure, I didn't want to do it without discussing it, just since it's a larger change that, you know, eventually we look towards getting into the rest of the libraries, um, and I didn't want to just push it onto the top of that PR and not, not ask about it or seek. Um, any kind of input. I think it's going to be very useful. I think that people will, be, it'll be kind of instantly available. Like, if we can point in support, in, in the terms of support, it'll be really great to be able to say, see, this library is really big or something like that. Yeah. Use this other library, or let's think about making a pared down version and we'll have a quantitative, uh, we'll know quantitatively how big something is, which is, which will be very helpful. I think, that's a I, think great should, I think it should be a separate PR. Okay. It's is my only thought it, on that. It will. So the reason it would be helpful to do it in the same one is because it compares the existing released version with the branch from the PR. Um, so we totally can do it as follow up one, but the numbers that it prints will be much, um, much closer, basically, since the one that would be released at that point would be pretty much identical to the one that would be in that follow-up PR. Um, so the difference actually helps it to be able to output um, more interesting numbers. Um, okay, um, I guess then, I mean, do you... Do you feel like that's going to work with the, with the current situation with that PR? Um, I like do. I do think so. Okay. I need to. I do still need to go over it this afternoon uh, in more in in more depth. So, um, you know, if I find anything that leads me to believe otherwise, then I would definitely check in again or or hold off on it. Um, okay. But off the top of my head, I think it does because I think we can add that um, and get it. Get essentially what it will do is make the the action spot just print the comment for us. Um, okay. All right. Then I get, that's fine. Okay. Um. That was my only concern, really. Okay. Yep. Is the reason why it measures compared to the previous release just that that is an easy number to find? Because my assumption would be it would compare it to the the branch before it was merged in. You know, say you you have a release and then you have 
a PR that you accept that adds 1K to your code, and you, you accept that PR, and then you've got a second PR and it adds eight bytes, it's going to say, oh, you added 1,008 bytes compared to the last release, if I understand correctly how that is going to work. Ah, I see. So if there was multiple merges within the span of the one release. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, I mean, definitely the intention is to be able to compare with what's there today. I And to be honest with you, I, I, I say that it compares to the released version, but off the top of my head, I don't recall if it is actually the released version or if it maybe like Git pulls main. Um, they do oftentimes happen... At the same time, main gets updated when or, or right before a release happens. So the majority of the time, those two things would be in sync. Um, but I don't actually, I don't recall off the top of my head which it does. So I'll have to double check that. And I am totally in favor of uh, essentially making it as relevant to each PR as it can. So if, if it is the case that we end up with multiple commits or multiple PRs in between releases, then I do think if it is currently pointed out releases, we'll want to switch it to do like main branch. That way it would see the difference for each one of them. The first one would get, in, in that scenario, the first one, assuming it was PR, would get a printout that says this one is plus 1k compared to the current one. And then the next one would get the printout that says this one is plus 8 bytes or whatever the example was. Although there's also rules yeah. about... Um, it may or may not print depending on the size of the difference as well. So if the difference is small enough, then it won't print the second time. Sure. Yeah, I was looking at the CircuitPython org size tools, and I see that there's a place where it is finding the the MPY files that appear to be from the bundle. So okay. that makes me think that what you described is what it does. Okay. So um, probably... Whereas to do the other thing, you'd have to figure out another branch, you know, check out some other code and MPY compile it. So it's more difficult, it's more work, but I think it might be right. a, a better, more accurate number. Okay, I will uh, look into changing that too. Yeah, I think we should be able to uh, get, get pull main and then just build that and use that as our... As the reference number. Current size, yeah, basically the... Um, yeah, if you can do that, I think that would be preferable. Okay, yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, and there is a note from Tetric uh, about another good one, though not sure how frequently it gets updated, is the Circuit Playground library, just because the size is so tight. Of the conditions the CI raises on, it might help create a good baseline. Um, the Circuit Playground library is useful. We do have this very tricky thing we do with the Circuit Playground library where we don't include all of it uh, on the Circuit Playground Express. We do include all of it on Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, um, or maybe not. Anyway, it's divided up with, in a tricky way with some uh, symbolic links. And so that's a, the actual size of it doesn't tell us that much um, in the CPX case. So I'm not sure if we'd want to, special, to handle that peculiarity or not. But it certainly would be good to look at. All right, and then I'll move on to um, MicroDev, who's text only. Uh, this might have been discussed before. Thoughts on making MicroPython core a submodule and CircuitPython not a fork. Uh, Jeff says that would mean getting down to zero core changes compared to MicroPython, which is at best extremely difficult. And I said, we have like very aspirationally discussed this with the MicroPython folks, but there are many things that are that differ. Um, the very, very core language stuff, we could maybe see doing that, but it require a lot of refactoring. And there's stuff that MicroPython does where there's less of a boundary between implementation and ports, um, or not implement, implementation and Python interface, which, for instance, they, MicroPython doesn't use the shared binding, shared module split up. So uh, this has only been very aspirational. Uh, well, another example that is in the Pi directory um, is we made a decision that we wanted our uh, async to be more like CircuitPython, and we changed things about the parser, about the bytecode uh, of MPY files, 
compared to MicroPython. And to make MicroPython core be a submodule, we would have to kind of negotiate each one of those differences with MicroPython and find a solution that satisfied both of us. Those might be additional uh, pound defines, but then that has a, a support cost to MicroPython that they wouldn't necessarily want to bear. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind. The, the shared bindings to me is less of a thing because that is not, I think, the code we would be trying to share. It would be the stuff inside the PY directory of the source code. That I'm that thinking about what's in benefit. XMOD, which is sometimes yeah. that only XMOD is what I'm thinking. So mm -hmm. MicroDev says in the chat, we are using expressive repos as submodules of modifications. So that is true. Um, but that would make CircuitPython not be a fork of MicroPython, but only have MicroPython. We would fork MicroPython core and then pull in things from that. But it would also require MicroPython to do some refactoring. And I'm not sure if they're willing to do that right now. Um, it, is, it is an interesting possibility. We, we've, we're now in a better state about keeping up with the merges that the merges are not so hard to do as they used to be. So um, we'd still have to do this kind of merging in any case. And uh, we're the only client of MicroPython right now. So kind of, or the, you know, the, I don't, I mean, there are probably some other forks, but we're by, I'm, I'm the only fork that, I, we're the only fork I know of that's kind of published. So uh, uh, there's, um... Is it OpenMV? I think they do use this approach yeah, yeah, okay. of submodule okay. of MicroPython, but they didn't have the interest in making core language changes, and we did. That was a very important thing. Right, and um, Naradoc points out that we don't always use a fork of Express if we can avoid it. Yes, that is true. We have a very minimal number of changes to Express. If usually we're they're they're patches that are in progress. Yeah, and so we've gone in and out of um, what the sub, which sub module we're using, uh, which makes it sometimes screws up people's <laughs> local repo, local clones, because uh, it's it's hard. Git gets confused by that sometimes, so you have to clean up carefully. But yeah, MicroDev, if you'd like to work on it, you can you can take a look. But uh, I'm not sure that. MicroPython, the MicroPython focus is so busy. I'm not sure if we, they would, they would be, uh, they would have feel they have the time to work on these changes. I guess one final note I would inject, and and I'll step out after this, um, is we don't necessarily have a good idea of what all of our deltas are that we're carrying, and we could look systematically at those. Someone could. I, I have a feeling. It will have to be somebody else because, you know, we're busy. It won't be me or Dan. Get an idea of what those are and which ones can go upstream. So, like, for instance, in my uh, hug report, I was talking about some work Jim, Jimmo is doing on changing the way a type object is specified in the C code. And I originally had an idea about how to save some Flash, and I implemented it in CircuitPython. And Jimmo has taken it, like, 15 levels beyond my idea. And that's going to go into MicroPython. When that comes, when his version comes in, we'll have to undo what we did in CircuitPython and do this other thing. And that has a cost. The cost is we'll have to do that work. But we had a benefit all this time because we were able to take the change, uh, my version of the change, way before MicroPython did. So identifying the deltas that we do carry and upstreaming the ones that we can is a way to make an incremental step toward maybe this will be possible someday because the way we can do that is by bringing our deltas down to zero. Um, yeah. Is kind of my line of thinking. I think another another thing that we have that's a significant difference that they're not necessarily going to incorporate anytime soon is the long-lived storage stuff. So, um, which is a bunch of minor changes in a bunch of places. Mostly, mostly extra arguments. Yeah, so that's it's worth it's worth it's it's always worth thinking about 
And it, it may not lead to exact, exactly this, but it leads to less, to fewer changes, which is a good idea. Even if we never get there, uh, it means that it's less work to do the merging. And it's the more con contributions we do to upstream, either conceptually or with actual code, the better, the closer we are together, which is good. All right. Uh, um, we can discuss this more kind of in the chat and stuff. Let, I'll move on to the next thing that MicroDev has. Enable GitHub discussion for stake overflow. Did you mean stack overflow? Um, like Q&A, a feature that isn't available in Discord or forum. So you're, um, I, I'm not sure what you mean, MicroDev, about uh, questions and answers because Either people do it in Discord, which isn't the greatest for threads, or they do it in forums, which most people don't participate in. Is that what you, um, is that, is that what you meant? I mean, I think we're a little worried about introducing yet another communications channel, which we have to monitor and respond to. Oh, I see. It has Q&A with upvotes and answers that can be chosen. Uh, that is interesting. Um, we might even consider making some rep a repo that is only for discussions or something like that. Uh, I, I would, I think Scott has also thought about this and um, it, we might discuss it when he returns, which is in mid November. Um, I know as, as people may know, uh, MicroDev is, is shutting down their forum and using GitHub discussions exclusively. MicroPython, and, you mean. MicroPython, sorry. What did I say? I don't remember. Okay. I heard you say MicroDev. MicroDev, yeah, MicroPython, MicroPython. And um, most people seem to like it. It is a little harder to keep track of um, what the new discussions are and stuff rather than in a, than in a traditional forum. The, the, that's the primary objection that I've seen people. But if it's more of a... Stack Overflow kind of uh, Q and A. That's interesting. Um, I mean, there's also discourse, and there's Stack Overflow or clone or things like Stack Overflow, which could be in GitHub or could be somewhere else. Those are all interesting. We have already have so many communications channels that um, I don't know. I get about 500 emails a day or something like that. So. Oh, Discord also added a forum feature? Oh, gee whiz. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, it's a good thing to think about also. And I think maybe we'll talk about it further in the fall when, say, Scott is back, is what I would say. Okay. Um, I think I'll wrap up uh, the meeting now. Um, the next meeting is next Monday, as usual, same time, same station. Um, I have one question. I started recording and then discovered about nine minutes into it that I have I had audio but not the screen. I fixed that. I don't know, uh, Foamy Guy or you you have done backup recordings. I don't if if you have one I'll use it. But otherwise I don't think it's a tragedy if uh, we have audio only for the first nine minutes. Yep. I have one running. I'll send you a link here in a little bit after it uploads. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. This is I, I have to have more trouble with most people getting recording right. And this had this is because I'm actually working on a completely new installation of Ubuntu and I didn't have I recovered most of the settings and OBS started just fine and it had the audio, but somehow it had to resync up with the window capture. And I didn't see that right away. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we'll see you everybody next week. Thank you very much. And I'll stop recording now.